Amen. Well, um, I got married at age 22, right when I got out of college, and my wife made it clear to me rather quickly that I did not understand the difference between cleaning and picking up around the house. <laughs> Am I the only one that had that trouble early on? I mean, now to be fair, I was coming out of like four years of bachelor pad with a bunch of guys living in the same house. Like we used to make it a contest with like the trash bucket. That's what we had is a trash bucket. And we would see like you, who could pile it up. Like if you were the last one to touch it when it's like your piece of trash, there's no way to situate it, that it would stay, you had to take the trash out. So Alicia married into that. <laughs> and uh, it was a little rough there for a couple of years, I'm going to be honest. <laughs> and, uh, but by God's grace, we made it through. <laughs> When we got our first home, we, um, Alicia started this conversation, I don't know, some months into it, this conversation about the need for a deep clean. And, you know, like not just the picking up, but the scrub brushes and bleach and chemicals I had never heard of and all of these crazy things. And it's, it's like she was trying to, I, it was intimidating, but that wasn't her intention, I don't think. I think it was to emotionally prepare me for what was about to happen, and, um, and so finally the Saturday rolls around. She told me, it's going to take a full day. This is not just an evening, Michael. And so, like, Saturday rolls around, and I'm ready. And Alicia's got, like, she, she goes off, and she's got, like, one little chore. She's buying something else at the Home Depot, and she's running back. And my assignment is to get the thing started in the bathroom. And so I, and so I do. I fulfill my assignment. And Alicia comes home. And she cannot believe her eyes. I am standing in the bathtub, and I have, like, rubber goggles on. I have rubber gloves, like, down to the elbows, scrub brush in hand. I have rubber boots on, no shirt, <laughs> and a bathing suit. <laughs> and she says, what in the world are you doing? And I say, cleaning? And she died in that moment. I actually had to perform CPR. No, not really. I was like, she did die laughing. Now, to be honest, that was my intention. I consider it, I don't know, husbands out there, if you're the same way, I consider it one of my husbandly responsibilities to shock my wife by being ridiculous and making her laugh. Anyone else in that same category? Yeah, yeah. That is what being a husband is all about. But the reason I tell you that story <laughs> is that just as there is a difference for us domestically between cleaning and picking up, the same is true for God cosmically. Like we shouldn't just imagine that if God's desire is to renew the entire universe that is subject to decay and corruption and sin and all of these things, that if he's to renew the entire universe, that he can do so by just picking up around the house. We shouldn't expect that he can just tuck evil quietly away in the corner and expect it to stay there and mind its manners. Like, if God's going to renew the universe, it's going to require a deep clean. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. God's deep clean of the universe. We're in a series called A Tale of Two Cities. And it's speaking of our journey from Babylon, which is the worldly city in the book of Revelation, to the new Jerusalem, which is the heavenly city. And the part that we're talking about today is really the last step on that journey. It's called the great white throne of judgment, which then gives way to God's new world. Next week, we're going to talk a, a whole lot more detail about God's new world, about what your eternal future is tangibly going to look like. But this week, we're going to be at that sort of crux, that uh, that fork in the road that goes one way or the other, but the meeting point right there is called the great white throne of judgment. It's going to be Revelation chapter 20. We're going to finish chapter 20 and start chapter 21. This is verse 11. Last week, we, got, uh, we talked through a really hard passage of the Bible, and, uh, and it brought us to the culmination, to the very end of the present age. And now we see what happens next, what happens at the end of the age. Let's read Revelation 20, verse 11. It says, Then I saw 
a great white throne and him who was seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books, according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. Amen. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write these da- this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for the murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death pretty sobering, isn't it? We tend not to think about judgment all that often, and I think it's a tragedy, because we tend to be focused on the here and now. We're focused upon the soccer practice and the basketball game. We're focused on paying that bills, or we're focused on meeting that deadline. We're focused on the here and now, and in truth, we have to be. You can't ignore those things. You have to be focused on those things, but One of my favorite quotes, Martin Luther, he says, I have two days on my calendar, today and that day. That is the day that he'll stand before God. If we don't face the judgment, before we face the judgment, we won't be ready for it. That is, if we don't have it in our mind and we're not thinking about and preparing for and planning for that day, then when that day comes, it will be more painful for us than it had to have been. And I want you to be prepared for the great white throne of judgment, as it's called. And so what I'm going to do, what we're going to do, is I'm going to walk through from this passage, sequentially, uh, seven characteristics of the judgment of God. Seven characteristics of the judgment of God. And I know these are hard topics for us to talk about. We'd We'd love to just talk about cute, fluffy things that make us all feel warm and fuzzy so that you can, you know, leave this building feeling all warm and fuzzy. But as Christians, that's not what we're called to do. Hebrews chapter 10, it says, don't give up meeting with one another, but instead keep gathering. Why? So that you may spur one another toward love and good deeds. Has anyone ever been spurred in the backside? Praise Jesus for it, right? Okay, like that you haven't is what I mean. <laughs> okay. But but when we come to church we should actually expect to be spurred in our spirits, okay? As well as comforted by the Holy Spirit. And I think we'll have both today. So seven characteristics of the judgment of God. Number 1, the judgment of God is pure. The judgment of God is pure. It's called a great white throne. Why is it called a great white throne? Great speaks of its immensity and white speaks of its purity. The judgment of God is immensely pure. This means that it is not tainted with prejudice or bias or partiality. It is not even 1%, not even 0.1% unfair. And I think that's an important one for us to talk about because in our modern culture, Hell has all been thrown out the window because that's a medieval concept. We've kind of outgrown it. It's unfashionable to talk about hell. It's, it's not fair. 
that God would even send people to hell. And now even within the church, you have people saying, well, the fires of hell purify so that they can go to heaven, and we've turned hell into purgatory, into essentially like this non-existent thing, because again, we don't want to face the judgment before we face the judgment. That is not wisdom. The judgment of God is pure, and he is pure and righteous and holy even in the fact that there is a hell, and even in the fact that some will go there. C.S. Lewis wrote a book called The Problem of Pain, and in it he wrestles with this. And honestly, if you're uncomfortable with the concept of hell, like, that's okay. Like, there is also such a thing as being too comfortable with it. Yep, lots of people going to hell, cool with me. No. Like, you shouldn't. Like, it actually should make us tremble at the thought. And if you feel uncomfortable, that's actually like a godly feeling inside of you, and yet let's stand on truth. And so here's what C.S. Lewis says about hell and the problem of pain. He says, in the long run, the answer to all those who object to the doctrine of hell is itself a question. What are you asking God to do? To wipe out their past sins and at all costs to give them a fresh start? smoothing over every difficulty and offering, offering every miraculous help, but he has done so at the cross on Calvary. Do you, want them to, do you want God to forgive them? They will not be forgiven. To leave them alone? Alas, I am afraid that is what he has done. In other words, if people spend their whole lives pursuing separation from God, in the end, he grants their wish. The judgment of God is pure. And at the end of time, there will not be one person who will be able to say, this was unfair. Number two, the judgment of God is terrifying. The judgment of God is terrifying. In verse 11, what we read, you remember that scene where it says that earth and sky fled away from his presence as, the, as if the universe had been too corrupted by the curse of sin to even stand in the presence of God, at the throne of God. And I think that creates a question. If not even earth and sky could stand in the presence of God, how much less should we have confidence that in our own frailty and human flesh, we'll be able to stand there and all will be fine? The judgment of God is terrifying. It uses this imagery of a lake of fire to talk about hell. Now, a lake of fire, is that literal? Is that symbolic? I'll tell you personally, <clears throat> I think it's symbolic. And throughout the Bible, fire is a symbol of judgment. Part of the reason I say that it's symbolic is that uh, Jesus will use other language to talk about hell is outer darkness. Outer darkness and fire are not exactly compatible images. Outer darkness speaks of the, the terrible loneliness of hell, but fire speaks of the pain of the judgment, so they both focus on a different dimension. And so I do believe it is uh, symbolic, but it is still a terrifying image. It's not like fire is symbol, symbolic for pleasantness, right? God's judgment is terrifying. And um, and so we see that in the earth and sky fleeing. We see that in the image of the lake of fire. Now, how many of you have heard somebody say, well, when you're sharing the gospel with people, talk about the love of God, but, uh, but don't talk about, you know, don't, don't focus too much on sin and judgment and certainly not hell and all of these things. You shouldn't talk about these because a more proper motivation for somebody to be saved is not fear of hell but love of God. Has anyone ever heard anybody say anything like that? Raise your hand for me. Okay. I think it's a false dichotomy. If you're drowning and I'm going to throw you a life preserver, would it make any sense if I said to you, don't take this life preserver out of fear of drowning. Take it for love of safety. <laughs> they go together. In Matthew 10, 28, Jesus says, don't fear him who, cast, who can kill your body but not your soul, but him who has the power to cast body and soul into hell. It's actually an appropriate thing, a wise thing for us to think about the judgment of God. The judgment of God is terrifying. Number three, the judgment of God is universal. The judgment of God is universal. Verse 12, 
He says that great and small will come before him at the judgment seat. This means that Tom Brady and the homeless beggar have equal status before the great white throne. If you're standing before God and everybody in the world knows your name, but God doesn't, it's eternal loss. If nobody in the world knows your name, but God does, it's eternal gain. Does God know you? The most terrifying words I can imagine come in Matthew chapter 7 where people have been crying out to Jesus, Lord, Lord. They actually think Jesus is their Lord, but it's just words. And he says, depart from me, you who practice wickedness. I never knew you. The judgment of God is universal. It's for the great and the small. It's for Tom Brady as well as the homeless beggar. It's for you and me. It's for everybody. Now there's an interesting phrase in verse 13. Uh, it says that the sea and death and Hades coughed up or gave up the dead that were in them. What's that about? In the ancient world, the sea was, uh, like if somebody died at sea, it was sometimes thought, just kind of general worldview, like if your body was never recovered, that it had ramifications for you in the afterlife. And so they thought like, uh, you know, like a lost body at sea meant you were a lost soul forever. Now, John didn't share that theology, but he's writing to some people who might have come from that sort of background, and he's saying, listen, buried or unburied, whether you're at, you die at sea or not, you will stand before the, judge, white, uh, the great white throne. No one's exempt. It's universal. When he says death and Hades will give up the dead that are in them, he's personifying death and the place of death so that uh, it's his way of communicating that there will be a resurrection for all people, buried and unburied, great and small, righteous and wicked, at the return of Jesus. The judgment is universal. Number four, the judgment is comprehensive. The judgment is comprehensive. And what I mean by that is it covers everything that you do, a sobering thought. Verse 12, it says that the, de the dead were judged according to what was written in the books, according to what they had done. Now, this is a, an allusion to Daniel chapter 7, and like, when in doubt, whatever chapter you're reading in Revelation, it probably alludes to Daniel 7. It's all over the place. Uh, but there you see books are open and there's a judgment. That's happening here too. If this was written in like the 21st century, you might have, it, it might have read something like this. And a film strip of your life will play, and everything will be shown. Jesus says, that which was done in secret will be shouted from the rooftops. Everything will be made plain. The secrets that you said, I'm taking to my grave, will follow you to the great white throne. And so, the judgment of God is comprehensive. But I will also say this, because I have to qualify that. It's different for those who know God than from those who don't know God. Okay? It's different from those who know God uh, the righteous, than for those who don't know God. Okay, so, uh, so how is it different? Uh, for those who know God, the purpose of these books of deeds that detail everything that you've done, the purpose of these deeds is to determine your differing degrees of reward in the age to come. And so it's not all going to be the same for everybody. Like the Apostle Paul who gives everything for Jesus versus like the thief on the cross who at the last minute is like, okay, Jesus, I accept you. Like their experience of eternity is not identical. And so there, there are differing degrees of rewards in the age to come, and it'll be based upon how you lived your life. But I do have good news for you. And the good news is that rooted in the new covenant, we're about to take communion here at the end of the service where the, the cup represents the new covenant and the blood of Jesus. That because of the new covenant, Jeremiah 31, 34, Jesus, uh, the, the Lord says, I will remember their sins no more. So what's the point? This is incredible. If you know God, he remembers your righteous deeds, but he forgets your sins. How cool is that? He remembers your righteous deeds, but he forgets your sins. Now, not forget as in like he doesn't even know they exist anymore. This is the Bible's way of talking. They will not count against you, not in the slightest, if you've had your sins 
forgiven by coming into covenant with Jesus through faith in him. So that is for the righteous. Uh, oh, and by the way, if, uh, if you've been with us for the whole series in Revelation, there's a whole series of rewards in Revelation 2 and 3 to overcomers. You know, like you get the tree of life and you get this and you get that. Like uh, all these different rewards, they all come to pass in Revelation 21 to 22 at the end of the book for the overcomers. Okay, so um, the wicked, it's different. Just like the righteous, the, the books are to determine our differing degrees of reward in the age to come. For those who don't know God, it will determine their degree of punishment in the age to come. Now, that's a strange concept for some of us, because, and this is maybe another reason why I don't think the lake of fire is literal, because, I mean, let's think about it. Fire's fire. It hurts just as bad for Hitler as like your atheist neighbor, who's generally a good citizen, right? Like fire's fire. So you can't really make it hurt more for one than the other. You can't make one punishment more severe. And yet the Bible indicates that in the age to come, for those who don't know God, there are differing degrees of severity of punishment. Jesus tells a parable to this effect. You can take a note and go back and read it, Luke 12, 47 to 48. He also overtly says this in Matthew chapter 11. Capernaum was Jesus' home base for doing ministry. And so you think about it, this place got like all the miracles and they got to see the Son of God. I mean, they, he was like right in their midst and they still wouldn't believe in him. And Jesus says to them, he says, Capernaum, it will be more bearable in the day of judgment for Sodom and Gomorrah than it is for you. That means that for those who don't know God, it will be less bearable for some than others. It'll be bad for everybody who doesn't know God. But there are differing degrees of punishment because God is perfectly just. So the judgment of God is pure, terrifying, universal, comprehensive. Final is the fifth one. Final is the fifth one. Uh, and this just comes in the phraseology of the second death. Can you think of a word that connotes greater finality than death? Can you think of a word more terminal than death? There is no resurrection or redemption from the second death. It actually is meant to communicate finality. I remember when I, uh, when I first like really encountered this, I had just been, uh, like the week before, playing basketball at the Bedford Boys Ranch with my good friend, his name was Michael and uh, we were laughing and cutting up and having a good time, and he was a good kid, and we were teenagers, and he went to Bell, and I went to Trinity, but we still had a friendship, and, um, but anyway, we, were, we had a great time, and then the next week, the word came out, he'd taken some drugs, and on drugs, he did something really crazy, he, he took his own life, and I was like, he wasn't even suicidal, like, what, what in the world, but he just, he went into this crazy place, and he just did it, and I, and I remember, like, when I would go up to the boys' ranch after that, and it's like he wasn't there, it was like the finality of death that just hit me as a teenager for the first time, even though people had died before that, but I was finally old enough to, like, realize, like, death means, means gone. Like, I'm not going to see him again. Second death, that's what it means. And there are lots of teachers in the church saying second death doesn't mean second death, and everybody's going to go to heaven and live a happy forever, and, that, and it's not true. The second death is real, and it's final. It's like Dante's, um, uh, in Dante's Divine Comedy. He says there's a sign above, above hell, and it says, abandon all hope, you who enter. Number six, the judgment of God is necessary. The judgment of God is necessary. Reminded of this uh, recently as all of us are dealing with the craziness of this pandemic and all the repercussions of, of that upon our culture and upon our world. Well, one of the things that's happened, and it's gotten a lot of criticism, is that um, in order to prevent uh, people who are in prison from getting infected, a lot of them have been released from prison so they wouldn't get COVID. Now, it's one thing if you're like a low-level drug offender and I'm, you know, there's like whole, we have like way too many in prison, many people in prison. I'm not making a statement about that. But what I am saying is for whatever reason, the decision was made to let lots of violent criminals 
out, like violent history out into major cities across the nation. Well, in Detroit, they let out a violent rapist, and he immediately went, and he, at knife point, raped three women. And the police chief commented on, like, around the nation, this is happening, he commented on it, and he says, listen, guys, it's not rocket science. When you let violent criminals out of jail, you run the risk of having more violent crime. You know, on the surface, it would seem like compassionate, like, oh, we, we don't want them to get COVID, right? But is it compassionate? You see, on the surface, it would seem like, let's just eliminate the final judgment because then it can be compassionate. God, let there be compassion. But, but this is the whole point. Like, you get to verse 8, and the reason it has that long list of, like, murderers and sorcerers and idolaters and all these people who aren't going to get in, just think about it like this. What if God just did away with the judgment and said, you guys just come on in just like you are? What if God just let unredeemed sin and evil into his new world? Guess what? You'd have the old world. You'd have Babylon forever and ever. You'd have that same old beast just putting on different clothes with every generation. You would have just endless evil. Like there has to be a stopping point. And listen, I want you to understand the heart of God. This has been sobering today to think about, but the scripture says that mercy triumphs over judgment. And you cannot understand how great the salvation is that Jesus purchased for us if you don't understand the depths that he went through in order to purchase it for you. You cannot ascend the mountain of God's unconditional love and grace if you don't realize how deep into the valley of the shadow of death Jesus went into on the cross. It's important that we dwell upon these things because Jesus bore this judgment so you would never, ever have to for the whole world. He doesn't delight in the slightest in sending people to hell. He's not like, oh, cool. You know, he's not up there, this capricious tyrant. He's quite the opposite. That's what the beast is. He is the lamb. The judgment of God is necessary because the universe needs a deep clean of sin and death and murder and sorcery and idolatry and mourning and weeping and pain and sickness and see. Did you catch that when we read verse 1? Did that strike anybody? Let me read it again in case you missed it. I saw heaven, a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. Isn't that kind of interesting? How many beach lovers we have in the house? God's going to have a hard time wiping away my tears if there's no beaches. I'm just going to like keep creating tears. This is going to be like this endless process. Here goes Michael again, crying because there's no beach. I love the ocean. <laughs> well, I have good news for you beach lovers out there. I don't, and I would say most scholars don't interpret this literally, as though John is trying to give us the topography of the new heavens and the new earth. Most scholars interpret this symbolically because in the Hebrew mind especially, the sea was symbolic. And you see this from the very first page of the Bible. The sea was symbolic of untamed chaos and the powers of evil. And you see this from the very beginning and God tames it and he, and he comes in and he, he forms the, the earth out of this ball. And then even when Israel is crossing the Exodus and the, it's, they part the Red Sea and it's like he conquers the sea. And then when Jesus is walking on the water, there's a deeper message there beyond like, wow, cool, Jesus could do cool stuff. It's actually like, no, Jesus is God in the flesh and he's come to conquer the powers of darkness and untamed chaos. And so this has come from the first advent of Jesus. When he came, he began that process, and it will be consummated at the return. It's his way of saying there will be no more evil. There will be no more untamed chaos. And you remember in the book of Revelation where the beast arises from what? The sea. And Babylon sits on many waters. And this is John's way of saying Babylon is soon to be replaced by the heavenly city 
and the beast is soon to be replaced by the lamb who gave his life for the sins of the world. Chaos and evil will be done away with. The point of all this is that if God is to wipe away our tears permanently, he has to do away with the cause of our tears. The universe needs a deep clean. The judgment of God is necessary. That's why when we get to um, chapter 21, verse 1, we see that first very important word, then. After the great judgment, after that cleansing, then I saw a new heavens and a new earth, for the old had passed away. The judgment of God is necessary. And here is the last one. The last one is that the judgment of God is good. The judgment of God is good. And this is related to uh, the last one, but a little bit different. And it's objectively good. It's universally good. Uh, it, it, and just like I said, objectively good by God's objective measures of truth and goodness and beauty. But the experience of that goodness will not be enjoyed by those who reject Christ in this life. It will not be enjoyed by those whose names are not written in the book of life. Did you notice there's really like two different kinds of books? It says the books were opened and they had you know, basically the deeds of all people but then there was another book called the Book of Life. Did you notice that? So if the first one is called the Book of Deeds, what's the difference between that and the Book of Life? One lists what we've done. The other just lists names. And if your name is in the book, you're in for all eternity. And if your name is not in the book, you're out for all eternity. That's a very powerful moment, right? Well, guess what? God wants you to know that your name is written in the book. Jesus says, don't rejoice that the demons are subject to you. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. It should actually be a mainstay of joy in the Christian life to know that you belong to God. And you say, well, how do I get my name written in the book? Well, let's talk from the human perspective because that's uh, the perspective John's going to take. What's the human responsibility here? And in chapter 21, verse 6, he tells us, he, uh, <clears throat> he says, To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. Point being, there's no moral requirement. All you have to do is thirst for something that this world can't offer and go to Jesus in order to satisfy that thirst. I love the fact that salvation is portrayed this way. That it's not just like, oh cool, I escaped the lake of fire and I guess that's it. No, Jesus actually satisfies. Babylon does not satisfy. The world system does not satisfy. She seduces. The world system brings you away and leaves you empty. As I've said before, and I think I said this a few weeks ago, God's the only form of happiness that doesn't come with a hangover. He wants to satisfy your deepest thirst, but you have to come to him in order to get it. On the cross, Jesus said, I thirst, so that you would never have to thirst again. He paid the penalty on the cross so that you could drink the water that is without payment. It wasn't without payment for him. He paid everything. It's without payment for us. Eternal salvation from the second death is absolutely free for those who repent and believe. Now there's a warning in verse 7. It kind of continues into verse 8. And it's important to pause and think about that because it will be a warning to us about what does it really mean to believe. Because in our culture, believe means agree with. I agree with basic historic Christian doctrine, therefore I'm saved. Agreeing with facts doesn't make you saved. Trusting a person, the Lord Jesus Christ, it makes you saved. Do the facts matter? Yes, they do. But a spreadsheet or a doctrinal list doesn't save you. Faith does. And so this verse will talk to us about the nature of faith. Let's read verse 7 again. Verse 7. It says, the one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, detestable, murders, etc., their part is in the lake of fire, the second death. 
So here's the question that arises is, if salvation is completely free, why do we have to conquer in order to enter the heavenly city? I think that's what it says right there, right? If you conquer, you get there. If salvation is free, verse 6, why, verse 7, do we have to conquer to enter into the heavenly city? Here's how I would say it. Salvation is free, but faith is costly. Salvation is free, but faith is costly. I remember when I first got saved, and I, I mean, I received it like this free gift, but immediately the Lord was like, Michael, he starts pointing stuff out. It began, it was my abusive alcohol consumption. And I, I made this huge commitment when I was 17 years old. I won't drink till I'm 18. <laughs> and my friends were like, whoa, you're crazy. And it was like this huge commitment, but it was like the Lord started with me. And so I ended up making it till I was 21. Praise Jesus, right? So um, anyway, but I started somewhere. <laughs> and then after that, I, I got an illness that, um, that really knocked me out. I, I struggled with depression for a while. And, um, and after that, and when I got married, I, I had struggled in early marriage, making my transli- transition from bachelorhood to partner in life. Those first couple of years were really rough for us. And I could go on and on, but there's always been at every stage something to overcome. There's always been something God has called me to. And, and this, the point of this passage is that's what faith looks like. Salvation's a free gift, but once you put your faith in God to give you that, he calls you to adventure. He calls you to sacrifice. He calls you to endure the trial of whatever it is that you're facing. Just think about Abraham. God appears to Abraham when he's in the land of Babylon, worshiping the moon. And God appears, and Yahweh, so full of grace, comes with all these promises. I'm going to bless you and make a great nation out of you. I'm going to do all these kind of... And he's like, I guess I should stop worshiping the moon. And so God graces him and blesses him. But no sooner does Abraham receive the free gift of salvation than he is set on a pilgrimage, set on a journey from Babylon to the promised land. And the same is true for you. Your faith is a journey. It is a pilgrimage. It is an adventure. It is an ongoing risk. It is an ongoing sacrifice. When Jesus was crucified for us and he stretched his arms wide and he took those nails, he had to open his hands to take the nails. And that's what God's calling you to do and me to do today. Faith is crucifixion, it's costly. It's costly. What is God calling you to open your hands to him? In what way? Is it your pocketbook that you need to open it up to him? Have you been saying, mine? And he's saying, mine. Is it your time? Is it your agenda? It's important that we have some self-examination here because we live in the Bible Belt and everybody says, I'm going to heaven and I believe because I agree with a certain set of doctrine, but true faith, is it, it involves courage. It involves risk. I think it's interesting that in verse 8 here, in this long list of vices, you see what the first one in the list is? Cowardly. Isn't that interesting? Cowardly. As if cowardice is the linchpin for every vice. The next one in the list is faithless. Why? Because faith without courage is dead. I began by quoting C.S. Lewis. I'm going to quote him again, and he has this quote about courage. Here's what he says. He says, courage is not simply one of the virtues, but the form of every virtue at the testing point, which means at the point of highest reality. A chastity or honesty or mercy which yields to danger will be chaste or honest or merciful only on conditions. Pilate was merciful until it became risky. Like Pontius Pilate, and like each of the seven churches, that each had something different, some different test, and you have a different test. 
Some of you, it's a certain inclination toward depression or anxiety. And some of you, it's a situation you have no control over. Some of you, it's legal. Some of you, it's financial. Everybody in here has been given something to overcome. Everyone is facing a test. And as soon as you get through this test, there will be another test because that is the nature of pilgrimage. We don't arrive until he arrives. And just like Pontius Pilate and just like these seven churches, we don't get to choose the test, but what we do get to choose is how we respond. Courage is how we pass the test. And for some of us, that might be courage to speak up. For some of us, that might be courage to stay quiet. For some of us, that might be courage to take a leap of faith. God's inviting you on a radical adventure. For others of you, it's to sit in the quietness of God and be still and wait for his deliverance. For some of you, courage might be getting up for the 100th time after failing the previous 99 tests. There's grace for you, and that's courage. As long as we're on pilgrimage from Babylon to the new Jerusalem, there will always be something to overcome. And the reason for this is that it's not just the universe that needs a deep clean. It's us. We need a deep clean. And if we want to enjoy the beauty, the eternal beauty of God's new world, we have to allow God to make us new first. And that takes courage. Let's pray.